Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel, I'm Chris. This is another one from the Fat Electrician. America's airborne anti-hero, Jake McNasty McNeese. This is a 35 minute video, I gotta break it down. A couple, uh, I'll call them 18 minutes, but you know. We're gonna do this in two parts. Unfortunately, he decided to do a longer one. So, before we get started, I'm switching things up. There's a thanks button on the channel. You can donate. You don't have to. You can subscribe if you aren't. And if you do subscribe or you are subscribed, <coughs> excuse me, you can click the bell. It notifies you for things. And if you don't want to do any of that, click the thumbs up. That helps me. Bare minimum. It's free. It's a very nice gesture. Ow. Okay. Let's get into the video. This is hands down gonna be the longest video I've ever made. I should probably pee first. Hold on. What the hell? <laughs> Today we're talking about America's Airborne Anti-Hero. Ladies and gentlemen, James Elbert McNeese, AKA Jake McNasty, the leader of one of the most notorious military groups of all time, the Filthy 13. The Filthy 13? I've never heard of them. I know the Dirty Dozen, but I don't know if that's real. Huh. And just to clarify, in case you don't know, being an anti-hero is not a bad thing, despite how it may sound. You see, the textbook definition of an anti-hero is a hero that does not display typical heroic qualities, which honestly is pretty ambiguous, but it's one of those things where you know it when you see it. So for example, a regular hero would be somebody like Superman. He's invincible, he shoots lasers from his eyes, and he always does the right thing 100% of the time. He never roughs up the bad guy. He always takes him straight to jail because the justice system never messes up anything. He only has sex in the missionary position. He always changes the batteries in his smoke detectors on time. It's boring, unrelatable, and completely inhuman behavior. Anyways, and then you have the anti-heroes, the fan favorites, the characters with human faults that they not only overcome, but turn into their advantage. Characters like Wolverine with his bad attitude, Deadpool with his morbid sense of humor. Hell, even Batman is an anti-hero because at the end of the day, it's more relatable to do karate in your garage, dress up like a bat, and then run around town beating up clowns and dudes on steroids than it is to be perfect. Yup! So I guess what it means to be an anti-hero is that you always do the right thing, but you don't always do it the right way. And if you were to ask me for a real life example of an anti-hero, I can't give you a better one than Jake McNeese. All right, here's the deal. Jake was born in all right, this will be interesting. In Oklahoma in 1919, he grew up during the Great Depression as one of 10 siblings. This guy had to learn how to hunt, fish, and trap just to help put food on his family's table so they could survive. He had his first full-time job when he was 10 years old and continued to work full-time all the way through high school. After graduating, he became a full-time firefighter. Shortly after that, the attack on Pearl Harbor happened. America entered World War II. Jake, however, was exempt from the draft because he was a firefighter, but that's not what Jake wanted. Jake wanted to volunteer and he didn't just want to volunteer for anything. Jake wanted to be a paratrooper and a demolition man. Jake wanted to jump out of a perfectly good plane behind enemy lines with a couple of buddies, be completely surrounded, and have nothing more than a gun and some explosives and just go out there and deprive the enemy of nice things. Got a bridge? Guess what? Now you don't. Nice power lines? It'd be a shame if somebody blew those up. That's what Jake wanted to do, and that's what he was gonna do. So at the age of 22, Jake set off for training. Upon arriving at training, Jake pretty much immediately establishes himself at being incredible at any task the army can throw at him, but also a humongous pain in the ass to his entire chain of command. During his very first week in the army, Jake got in a fist fight with the staff sergeant in charge of the chow hall because the staff sergeant wouldn't give him butter with his bread. At which point, the entire chain of command is like, on one hand, we have to get rid of this guy. He's a loose cannon. You absolutely cannot be attacking staff sergeants as a private. He's got to go. But on the other hand, this is exactly the type of behavior we're looking for for somebody. I was going to say, on the other hand, he's got a point. I mean, having a little bit of butter with your bread. It's reasonable. <laughs> that we want to drop behind enemy lines and expect to fuck up everything. So they just kind of let it slide. Fast forward a couple of weeks, Jake is doing a demolition course and he ends up setting the course record. He is the fastest person to ever complete this course. At which point his leadership walks up and is like, hey soldier, congratulations, you broke the record. Jake looks the guy in the eye and goes, yeah, if you think that's impressive, you should see what I can do when I have some butter once in a while. 
And that pretty much sets the tone for the rest of Jake's training. He absolutely crushes any task they give him, but also, Jake does not give a single fuck about the dog and pony show that is the US military. He's not gonna call an officer sir or ma'am. He's gonna call him by their nickname. He's not gonna salute them unless they salute him first. He's not gonna stand outside and salute the flag during retreat, and he absolutely is not gonna show up to formation on time, and he's definitely not gonna be sober all the time, because that's just how Jake is. And because of this, Jake would be the only new recruit you can't get away with that kind of stuff today, but back then, yeah, I could see exceptions being made. Look, the guy's insane, but we're going to be dropping him behind enemy lines. What are you expecting? By the way, like when um, during the Civil War, U Ulysses S. Grant was winning. But they called him a butcher, and they were telling Lincoln, you got to get rid of this guy. You got to get rid of him. And he goes, I can't get rid of this guy. He wins. And they were like, yeah, but he's a drunk. And he was like, really? We'll find out what he drinks. So I'll send more of them to him. That was, I, I phrased that terrible. Find out what he drinks so I can send more of, you know, his alcohol. Because he didn't care about that. If this man wants butter... <laughs> I would send sackfuls of butter on airdrops. <laughs> to not get promoted to PFC, which is a way bigger deal than it sounds like, because at this point in time, in the 101st Airborne and the 82nd Airborne, every single new recruit after 31 days of training got promoted to private first class. The reasoning behind that was they wanted to give these guys a promotion so they can make more money and ideally send that money back home to their families because, well, they've got a very dangerous job coming up and nobody knows what's going to happen. So absolutely everybody is getting promoted to PFC after 31 days except for Jake. But here's the thing, Jake didn't really care. Jake wasn't there for the money. He was there for one thing and one thing only. We're going to be doing one thing and one thing only, killing Nazis. So Jake is now the lowest ranking person in his entire company and leadership was hoping that Jake would take this as a sign that he should start cooperating and get it together. That doesn't really happen though and leadership now has no idea what to do with Jake because on one hand, he's way too valuable to lose but on the other hand, they don't want him mingling with all the other soldiers rubbing off on them in a bad way. So they take Jake, they stick him in his very own platoon all by himself and make him his own acting platoon sergeant. And then as time passes, whenever they get another soldier just like Jake, they would send him over to join Jake's platoon, and he would eventually get four members in his platoon, counting him for a total of five, and they would become known as the Dirty Five. And from there, things would obviously get really out of hand. Fast forward, Jake and his men finish the first phase of their training and they are given a pass to go out on the town one last time before they have to go to Fort Benning for airborne school. So Jake and his men, you know, his men that all outrank him because he's still technically a private, but he's also somehow their platoon sergeant. They all go out, they go to the bar, they get drunk. They end up running into some MPs. One of his men starts lipping off to the MPs. The MP goes to beat him with a nightstick. Jake interferes and says, hey, he's really drunk, let it slide. In Jake's own words, and I quote, he's so drunk he couldn't hit the floor with his hat in third case. So just let it slide. He's going to get his men back. To the <laughs> he, couldn't hit the, he couldn't hit the floor with his hat in 30, float, 30 throws. That's a good one it's going to be fine. The military police, the MP, then tells Jake, mind his own business, as he turns around to hit Jake's guy with a nightstick, at which point Jake proceeds to beat the shit out of two MPs, taking their Colt 45 1911s, firing all the ammunition into a nearby street sign before handing them back their empty guns and saying, okay, now you can take me to jail. The next morning, Jake's commanding officer shows up to the stockade to talk to Jake, and he's like, look, not surprised you're here, don't really care what happened. Here's the deal. The Japanese have the world record for the longest ruck march, and I want to break that record by having a group of guys march from here all the way to Fort Benning, 136 miles, and I think you and your men are some of the guys that are going to be able to pull it off. Are you in? At which point, McNeese is like, 136 miles isn't a problem at all. I won't change my socks, and I won't even get a blister, which, if you've never been in the military, and you've never ruck marched, saying that you're not going to change your socks or get a blister on a 136 mile fucking ruck march is an unprecedented amount of shit talking. It's like a NASCAR driver saying that he's going to win the Daytona 500 without having his tires changed a single time. It's like going out drinking, ending up at Taco Bell at two in the morning, eating a bunch of steak quesadillas, waking up the next day, taking a shit and not wiping. Okay. It's just, it's not possible. 
So then the commanding officer was like, great, cool. I'll see you at the ruck march. We're going to go ahead and leave you in the stockade for the next 10 days. Until then though, Jake's like, cool, no problem. I'll hang out. 10 days later shows up. Jake is in a prison uniform with a giant P on the front and three MPs show up with 12 gauge shotguns loaded. And they escort Jake to the starting line of this fucking ruck march like he's Hannibal Lecter. There he changes into a normal uniform and takes off on a 136 mile ruck march to Fort Benning so he can go to airborne school. And sure enough, true to his word, Jake is one of only 75 men to finish this ruck march and he did not change his socks and he did not get a single blister, which I cannot stress to you enough is a superhuman feat. So Jake and his men go on to do airborne training. Absolutely no problem. Nothing really of note happens here, except for the fact that Jake is still a private and has still not been promoted in any way. After completing airborne training, Jake and his men are gonna go to Camp McCall, North Carolina, where they are to receive expert saboteur training. They'll be receiving extra training in demolitions. They'll be receiving training in how to drive tanks, how to drive bulldozers, how to drive excavators, how to drive trains, pretty much anything and everything they could teach these guys to be able to wreak havoc on enemy infrastructure is what they're learning camera i was going to say they're just teaching them how to just be a pain in the ass once they land to be able to do and destroy and screw up and ruin anything and everything that they come across <laughs> call North Carolina. Jake and his men continue to do what they do. They wreck every task that they're given. It goes perfect. Jake and his men are now about to go to England, at which point they are given one last pass to go out on the town one last time before they ship off. So Jake and his men go out drinking. Somehow or another, they end up at this little tiny diner neighboring a train yard, at which point one of the trains pulls up, stops, walks across all the other tracks, and the conductors go in and they start eating at this diner. Jake is super drunk and he's like, I don't want to walk back to the base. I'm stealing that train. And that's exactly what he does because the army just taught him how to drive trains. So Jake proceeds to steal a train and drive it all the way back to just outside of Camp McCall where he abandons the train, goes in and goes to bed. But everybody knows Jake did it. Nobody's turning him in. So Jake gets away with it again and now jake and his men are off to england so jake and his men arrive in england at this point jake has 13 men in his platoon including himself and they all come to the same exact conclusion english food fucking sucks which is on par with every opinion of it i've ever heard which seems weird to me because it's a country that took over most of the known world for the sake of trading spices and apparently nobody came to the conclusion that hey maybe you should put some on the food but whatever because the food sucks jake the I've never had British food, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it sounds very mean <laughs> to have said that. <laughs> decides, hey, I'm a master at hunting and fishing and all this other stuff. I'm just going to kill enough animals to feed my entire platoon by myself. And that's exactly what he does. The only difference is he has military grade equipment to do it. Jake is going out in the woods at night with a spotlight and an M1 Grand. And as soon as a set of eyes looks at him, it's getting blown to smithereens. Jake has his men going out fishing with explosives. Okay. They are eating everything. Couple of problems with that. One, there's strict water rationing going on. The soldiers are only allowed to have one shower a week is how little water they have to spare. So all 13 of his men come together and they decide, hey, we're just not going to take showers and we're going to use all of our water rations to clean and cook all of this game that we're killing. And because now they started stinking, they would all become known as the filthy 13. The other problem with that was apparently all of the game was technically the property of the king and the only people that were allowed to hunt it were the lords and ladies of the land, which definitely was not Jake McNeese and the Filthy 13. So Sir Ernest Wells ends up figuring out what Jake's been doing. He gets super pissed, ends up suing the government for like $10,000 for all the animals that Jake and the Filthy 13 ate. The entire unit gets in a bunch of trouble and Jake's kind of just like, meh, I mean, what, what are you going to do? I, I was hungry, so I ate some food. What do you want from me? If I'm in trouble, go ahead and punish me. What are you going to do? Stick me in an airplane, make me jump out into enemy held territory where a bunch of Germans are going to try to kill me? Joke's on you. I'm into that shit. 
and the entire military is just kind of like, we have, we literally have no way to punish him. So he gets away with it yet again. Fast forward June 5th, 1944. The day before D-Day, Jake and the Filthy 13 are given a separate and extremely dangerous mission of going out, capturing and occupying an enemy held bridge that's supposed to be able to help allied tanks penetrate further inland. After a day, they'll be reinforced from troops landing on Utah Beach. And if Jake can't capture and occupy the bridge, he is to blow it up so that the enemy can't use it for reinforcements. This mission is deemed extremely dangerous and borderline impossible, but leadership figures, if anybody can pull it off, it's going to be Jake and the Filthy 13, because let's face it, the entire command structure at this point in time is basically looking at Jake's platoon like a fragmentation grenade of fuckery and bad attitude that they finally get to yeet at the enemy. So after receiving their mission, Jake and his men go out to start boarding the C-47s to take off at midnight to jump into Normandy, at which point Jake decides that he's going to whip out his straight razor and shave himself a mohawk. He tells everybody that he's part Choctaw Native American and he wants to honor that heritage. However, in reality, while he was part Choctaw, he had heard that Germany had a lice epidemic and wanted to go there with as little hair as possible. Regardless, his men followed suit and all shaved mohawks. They then began donning black face paint, at which point Jake is like, this is cool, but we can make it cooler. So he goes over to the C-47 that had a fresh white stripe painted down the side of it to identify friend from foe, and the paint was still wet. So he runs his fingers through the paint and goes around painting all of his men's face with white face paint as well. Unbeknownst to Jake and the Filthy 13, there were camera crews there taking pictures and recording them, and they would actually end up going viral, and the entire nation would be captivated by the unique and dangerous look of these men as they prepared to jump into enemy-held territory. So much so that it would actually inspire a movie to be made known as The Dirty Dozen, and Jake and his men would be none the wiser to any of it until after World War II. I said I had heard of The Dirty Dozen. I didn't, I didn't realize that was based off of them that's crazy and I only knew the Dirty Dozen just because it's a name Charles Charles Brunson oh Jim Brown uh, let's see I don't recognize maybe George Kennedy oh Ernest Borgnine okay Lee Marvin Lee Marvin no I'm thinking Lee Majors uh, now I gotta watch this movie. Huh. That's crazy. June 6, 1944, Jake, the Filthy 13, and 18,000 other paratroopers take off in C-47s as they prepare to jump behind enemy lines before the amphibious invasion at D-Day. About 20 miles from the targeted drop zone, Jake's plane gets hit with enemy flak fire and is losing altitude and they have to bail out early. Moments after McNeese jumps out of the plane, the entire plane explodes, killing some of the Filthy 13 and scattering the rest miles apart. So Jake lands, he's completely unharmed, and he has all of his equipment. The only problem is he doesn't have any other Americans anywhere near him. So he just kind of takes off. He gets in a couple of long range firefights with the Germans, takes a couple of them out in close quarters combat, and he's just going around trying to find any other paratroopers to group up with. And it's going on for hours and hours and he can't find anybody. And he's starting to think maybe the whole thing was a catastrophe. Maybe it got called off. Maybe I'm the only guy out here right now. What am I going to do? And he finally comes across one other American paratrooper. And it's a machine gunner that lost track of his machine gun during the jump. And this guy is running around Normandy with nothing but a belt of machine gun ammunition and no gun. And Jake is like, Jesus, okay, well, you're with me now, I guess. Here's my grenades. You take those. I'm going to keep my M1 Grand. Follow me. So now Jake and Grenade guys set off to find more paratroopers. So they keep looking, looking, they find some more. They find a squad of mortar guys. They find some guys over here, some guys over here. Slowly, Jake amasses an entire platoon of about 35 paratroopers, and they're all going to help Jake in his mission to take out this bridge. So Jake and his new companions start making their way to go blow up this bridge, at which point they would eventually come up on an entire American unit being led by this colonel. And the colonel is like, hey, you're working for me now. I don't care about that bridge. I need you to go pull security over on this this part over here. McNeese tried arguing with the colonel, but the colonel wasn't having it. He gave a direct order and McNeese is like, okay, fine, whatever. I'll take my 35 guys and we'll go guard this for you. So they take off headed there. They get to the point they're supposed to guard and McNeese just keeps walking because it was the same direction as the bridge. All of his men are like, hey, we're supposed to stop here. McNeese is like, you do what you want. I have to go take care of this bridge. You can come with me. I'd appreciate it. If not, Stay here and guard it. I really don't care. All of the men go with Jake and proceed to make their way to this bridge. 
So Jake and his men show up to the bridge, they capture it, they build up some fortified fighting positions because they now have to hold it for a day until reinforcements from Utah Beach can arrive. So the Germans start showing up, they fight the Germans back every time, one day passes, no reinforcements. Day two, they keep fighting the Germans back, holding the bridge, holding the bridge, no reinforcements show up. Day three, the Germans are now on the other end of the bridge with Jake and his men over here, and it is just no man's land in between on the actual bridge, when suddenly an entire squadron of P-51 Mustangs comes up and blows up the entire bridge, because apparently the American leadership determined there's no way Jake was going to be successful in his mission, so they blew up the bridge anyways. Thankfully, Jake and his men would make it out okay. None of them were harmed in the blast from the P-51. Now, at this point, Jake decides, hey... We're going to continue to hold our position here because if anybody is going to try to cross this ravine, they're going to do it right here where the bridge used to be. And sure enough, an entire German infantry battalion shows up on the other side of where this bridge was. At this point, the German officers make their way through the ravine and up to Jake under a white flag where they're like, hey, go ahead and surrender. We've got 700 men. You've got 35. It's going to be a bloodbath. Just call it a day. Jake, being Jake, is like, no. No, but you're welcome to surrender to me. The German officer, thoroughly annoyed, is like, what are you doing in that mohawk head of yours? I have 700 men, you need to surrender or I'm going to kill all of you. At which point, I'm paraphrasing here, but I would assume Jake said something along the lines of, yeah, yeah, you've got 700 men, but you're going that way and the battlefield is that way, which tells me that all my buddies showed up on Utah Beach and they've been kicking your ass so bad that now you're trying to run away from them. So the way I figure it, you've got about three options. Option A, you surrender to me right here, right now, and you all live happily ever after. Option B, you go back to your men, you hold your position right where you're at, and all my buddies show up in a little bit with a bunch of Sherman tanks and proceed to un-German engineer all of you motherfuckers. And option C, you guys try to fight your way through this ravine with me guarding it, which to be honest, I would recommend the least. I have the high ground, I have fortified machine gun positions, and you've got to make your way through a ravine first, meaning that I basically also have a moat. So, I will effectively be going medieval on your ass if you choose option C. Now, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but if I was you, I would pick option A, because if you pick option B or option C, I can pretty much guarantee that the next piece of officer correspondence that you're going to get is going to be from a fucking Ouija board. At this point, the German officer storms off with his... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to the 18 minute mark. And if, if a battle happens, I'll, I'm going to stop it anyways. And then I'll jump back to 1730 for the next video and uh, we'll carry on. So kind of won't miss anything. We hair on work. fire he's absolutely pissed jake then goes over to his men and he's like hey uh get ready for a fight i'm pretty sure i just poked the bear we'll see what happens sure enough like an hour later 700 german infantrymen proceed to take off and attempt to bum rush jake and his men in their fortified fighting positions now i don't know what you know about military tactics but generally speaking it is a terrible idea to run face first into machine gun fire it's also a terrible idea to try to fight the enemy when they have the high ground if you don't believe me ask anakin but running face first into a fortified machine gun position through a moat while they have the high ground and the men running the machine guns are under the command of some American with a mohawk, Native American face paint, who everybody calls Jake McNasty, is literally a lifetime supply worth of shitty ideas. Jake. I'm going to pause it right there. We'll take it back to the eight. We'll take it back to like 1740 when the battle kind of starts. So we'll kind of uh, uh I want to say lapse over it but I don't know if that's right we'll overlay it how about that so I'm going to end it here this is part one America's airborne anti-hero Jake the guy is I mean you got to say this you say he's an anti-hero but at the same time he's just one of those people that doesn't conform but he does what you need done so we're going to end it here, but we'll see how it turns out. Um, till part two, have a good day, have a good night.